going to look at how to curate information without any central authority. Decentralization is a key when we talk about blockchain. Uh, to tackle this question, to tackle this issue is uh, Andy, uh, uh, team lead at status I, status dot I am, right? Yes. Andy is one of the guys that I have, I've known for some time in the blockchain space. He's such a cool guy. Please. So in order to answer this question, we need to understand a little bit of the history and ask what made PageRank famous. So PageRank is the algorithm that Google uses to rank information that you see in any Google search. And I think that the key understanding to take away from this is that, you know, Marshall McLuhan once said that the medium is the message. And Larry Page and Sergey Brin were the first people to realize that, in fact, online, back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, the problem was not how to display information in such a way that people could sort of recognize and interface with it, which is what everybody else was trying to do. The fundamental problem had shifted because the medium itself had changed. And the fundamental problem with information on, online in the early 2000s was how we organize this stuff in such a way that it can actually be useful to people. Right? And they developed PageRank, this a little graphical representation of how PageRank actually works, which is it just sort of counts the amount of incoming and outgoing links from any given web page and then assigns a weight to it, which is what results in uh, it sort of moving up in the Google search. It's, it's much more complicated these days, but that's the basic idea behind it. Um, of course, you see, the problem now is uh, not just uh, organizing information, it's about who gets to organize that information, 
what they allow you to see of it and how they organize it. Right? Uh, it's about what personalization really means in a world of, sort of targeted personal advertising and political manipulation. Uh, so there's a really nice cartoon there which I quite enjoy. Uh, so how do we solve this? Right? How do we curate information without relying on a central group of actors like Google or Facebook or any of these big internet companies? You can see I've got a really great sort of photo there. There's this uh, idea in uh, cryptocurrencies called token curated registries. The basic idea is that, that you build a list of the information that you're interested in and then you allow people to vote with actual economic tokens on the information in that list. So you can sort of get people to give you skin in the game signals about what information they actually find to be valuable in the world. And you can assign in a very direct and literal manner economic value to information. And you can do that in such a way that is very, very difficult to corrupt because we can actually program the incentives around these systems in a sort of falsifiable and testable manner, right? So as Aragon says, which is another company on uh, Ethereum that we work closely with, is we can now experiment with governance at the speed of software. Right? We can now experiment with curation at the speed of software. We can experiment with all this stuff at the speed of software. And this is what these networks have really enabled. Uh, the disruption, when you really think about uh, experimenting with things like governance and the curation of information at the speed of software, it's very, very difficult to imagine. So, token curated registries are great, but uh, this is kind of what they look like. And I'm being a little bit disingenuous here. This is an early prototype from a crew of people called AdChain, who are doing a really, really great job, and I'm really quite a big fan of Mike Golden, who's the guy running this. But you can see that this is really complicated. Right? You've got your address, you've got all sorts of stuff about the voting that's going to happen, all the different stages in the voting where it can get reviewed or challenged, you've got to know what tokens are, you've got to stake them, you've got to do all sorts of crap that only like, geeks in the world really know about. Right? And the point is that I don't want to have to actually vote on what links appear first in my Google searches, right? I want those. I just want those links to be transparently the most valuable to me. And if I really, really want to, I want to be able to influence them. Uh, so that's, uh, that's sort of what we're aiming for here with how we curate the apps, right? Information that appears must be the most relevant and valuable to me. The organizations responsible for that information must be providing the most value to the community. Nothing must be missing from that list, and if it is, it should be easy for me to inspect the original list and understand why it is missing. But I should be able um, to influence information on that list, should I really desire to? Right? That's really what we're trying to do here when we organize information. Uh, so how do, we, how do we achieve that? Well, just to sort of beat a dead horse, a lot of people uh, sort of deep down in cryptocurrency have said, well, if you want to try and decentralize the way that information is curated, you need to farm that out to the community. Let them decide for us how we're going to do this information thing. And then reward and incentivize them with tokens so that we can actually get people to want to do that. And in my, in my thinking, this is fundamentally the wrong approach um, because a more accurate sort of consumer crypto economics is all about mechanism design for systems with the optimal flow of information that cannot be coerced by any group, including the community, right? The key point, I think, to understand for everybody in the room, and this applies to much more than just the curation of information, is that these systems, are fundamentally about decentralization, right? Egalitarianism is a great success metric for decentralization done well, but not the other way around. It's really, really important to me that people understand that what we're trying to do here is not necessarily make the world a better place with lots of fluffy ponies and unicorns and Labrador puppies gamboling through fields and daisies. We are trying to build decentralized systems that cannot be coerced by any single group of actors. If we're successful in that, we can build a more equitable and egalitarian world. But the point is that you cannot aim to build egalitarian systems because egalitarianism is not a mathematical function that can be optimized. Decentralization is. And that's a really, really fundamental insight of Bitcoin and all of the things that came after it. It's the reason why a six-page white paper can have such an effect on the world because he optimizes for decentralization and not some sort of obscure notion of what it might look like to have a more egalitarian world. Right? It's really important to me that everybody realizes that egalitarian, egalitarianism is a great success metric. It is not 
the goal of the system. Right, so the question is, you know, how do we, uh, I said in, in the user needs, remember, that uh, the organizations responsible for this stuff must be providing the most value to the community, but how do we actually define the value to the community, right? Is it downloads, is it stars, is it user reviews, uh, is it views on a YouTube video? All of this stuff is sort of very easily manipulable, right? Like, if I really want to, I can just sort of either spin up a bot farm or hire some people in China through Mechanical Turk and get them to watch a video a million times and sort of skyrocket the rankings. Um, so, like, how do we actually define who provides the most value to the community? Well, we all know, right, and I think there are a lot of bankers in, in this room, that free markets are the most effective means of doing what we call allocative efficiency. So free markets are the best means that humanity has discovered of allocating resources well and efficiently in societies. So, let's build the most radical free market that we can in terms of how we curate the apps. That means that, quite simply, whoever pays the most, in our case, we use a token called an SMT, which is the Status Network Token. This is an open source protocol. Anybody can use it. Anybody should be able to deploy a contract in less than 100 lines of code and curate information that they're interested in. So anybody who stakes the most tokens ranks highest in the store. That is the pure price discovery mechanism radical free market that we implement. However, of course everybody here knows that with completely radical free markets, you have this problem that the most resourced actors, i.e. the people with the most money, can easily influence the outcome of the system, which is why we have regulations sort of and sort of anti-monopoly laws. Right? But we don't want human regulations. It's the whole point of Bitcoin and Ethereum. We want maths, right? So what we'll do is we'll say, whoever stakes the most SNT ranks highest in the store, with the one important caveat that the more that you stake to rank in the store, the easier it is for people to influence your ranking. Uh, that means um, that we'll use one idea from token curated registries, but not the whole shebang, uh, which is really quite important. And so we implement free markets, a simple user interface, and maths and we can get to a sort of optimal curation of the information in decentralized systems without having to rely on any single person. So that's the first curve, right? I, I include the maths if you're interested in it because it's in, it is interesting, but you don't have to necessarily understand it. All we're sort of plotting here is the amount of SAT staked to rank in the store on the bottom on the x-axis and the number of votes minted on the y-axis. So you can see it's an exponential curve the more SMT you stake to rank, the easier it is for people to buy votes that will influence the ranking of your products. And that means that you know, we can simply plot the costs just for those bankers who do really like neat graphs in Excel. Uh, it's also a decreasing exponential curve. Uh, and then there's some important other rules that we can come, that we can come to. Right? So for every SMT you stake in the store, it becomes like a certain number of votes are minted. The more SMT you stake, the more votes are minted. Um, they can be bought by anyone in the world to either upvote or downvote your DM. That's what that graph says. Right? There's a few other things that we need to implement in order to get to what we call a Nash equilibrium, which is a specific game theoretical construct, which we aim for in designing crypto economic systems. The more votes that have already been cast, the more expensive it ought to be to vote further. Right, ideally speaking, you would want it to be such that the closer a vote comes to moving the DM down in the score, the more expensive it should be to cast. It's very difficult to do that dynamically, especially with the state of smart contracts at the moment. So uh, we'll use this as a proxy and just say that the more votes have already been cast, the more expensive it is to cast more. Uh, and importantly, when I downvote your DM in the store, that does affect the balance of it, and it does move it down. But when I upvote it in the store, all that that achieves is it makes it more expensive for people to <coughs> vote further on your product. It's important that upvotes don't actually move the D app up in the store because of a specific kind of attack in the system. So uh, here you can see we've, uh, we've got our original blue and red lines, which show the amount of tokens, uh, the amount of votes minted for the token state and the cost associated with that. And then what we've done is we've said, 
uh, only a specific amount of the tokens that people stake are actually available uh, to, uh, to mint votes with. And you can come and speak to me afterwards about exactly why that is. It's difficult to explain in a 20 minute presentation. Um, and we can sort of shift a little bit the X intersection of those curves to the right, which is also important from a mathematical perspective. But stick with me here, right? Um, because what's most important here is that it costs users to vote, which is radically different from how token curated registries are generally done where we want to try and incentivize the community. Uh, it's really important to realize that it costs users to vote and that, that cost goes directly back to the developer, right? There's no central intermediary status, doesn't take any profit from this system. Quite literally, if you want to vote on a product, if you feel strongly enough as a user that this ought to be higher or lower in the store, you can do that and you can affect the ranking of the store, but it costs you to do so and that cost goes directly back to the person that it affects, right? which is exactly what results in what I mentioned earlier, which is quite a neat Nash equilibrium. Um, and it also means uh, that like, if developers are sort of trolled by people in the community or if there's uh, like corporate warfare, you can imagine that Google might want to try and download DuckDuckGo. Uh, well, they can do that, but A, the money that Google m needs to use to download DuckDuckGo goes directly back to DuckDuckGo. And the result of corporate warfare is more SNT staked into the store, which means there's less SNT in circulation, which means that the community of SNT holders benefits because there's greater demand and higher prices for those tokens. So even the effect of negative corporate and social behavior like trolling and corporate warfare benefits the community of token holders that this is a part of. And this is why like I say that decentralization is a much more interesting thing to try and optimize for than egalitarianism. Because when you do this, you have these interesting side effects where you can build systems that actually benefit as wide an array of participants as possible. Uh, so we've sort of, uh, we've, we've covered this, um, most of that. And the point is that it brings us back to this fact that the products and services that rank most highly in the community have to be those that provide most value to that community. Right, so we said that things like views, downloads, user rankings are very, very easy to manipulate. This system institutes quite literally the fact that whoever ranks most highly in the store is the person who has put forward the most SNT to rank there, which means they have removed the most SNT from circulation, which means that at a quite literal level, they have provided the most value to the community that's interested in uh, that particular ranking of information. Uh, so I've got a little dancing banana because I think that's enormously cool. Um, I also have written a smart contract which you can go and check out. Like I say, uh, I'm still doing a little bit of work on this. Some of the maths needs to be smoothed out just a little bit. Um, but like I say, it's really important to me that this stuff is open source because it should be possible for any community of token holders to curate information that they're interested in. If this uh, was kept closed source status, and if it works like I think it will, um, you know, it, it's it's going to result in some enormous benefits to early token holders, which goes directly against egalitarianism as a success metric, which is why it's important that we still think about egalitarianism, but not as the thing for which we optimize. So if you want to go and check out that smart contract, it's there. Uh, I'll, I'll probably push some, uh, some changes and commits that I've been working on uh, in the next few days, uh, just to do with some smoothing out of the functions. Um, so the conclusion here, right, and I think that this is again really important to realize as we talk about what money is and what value is and why the BIS is just so deeply wrong about the way that they look at the world, is that uh, tokens are just these sort of abstract data structures against which mathematical operations can be performed, right? It's fundamentally very important that you recognize it because that allows you to tell a different kind of story and implement a different kind of fiction in terms of how we organize society, right? Uh, the aim in curating any kind of information without any central authority should be to uh, design and build systems that do not depend on any single group, including the community. Right? Tokenizing information is a great way to do this, but not when you take it literally, because it complicates the incentives and the user <coughs> interface enormously. Uh, and that's why if you go and look at that contract, I've called these tokens that we're emitting votes, so that it is very, very clear that the only incentives that this system are those of the 
developer that wants to get their product ranked, right? Much in the same way that like you would currently pay for AdWords or SEO or any of these kind of things, you would pay to get ranked in these decentralized stores. Importantly then, the users of those stores benefit as a side effect of the optimal curation of information, which is affected by this pure price discovery mechanism. Much like they do in the current system with the important difference that they know exactly why it is that that person or product appears first in their search. It's utterly transparent to them why they're there. And if they really, really, really want to, they can affect the ranking of that person or product. Moreover, the developers, instead of just paying money to Google for AdWords or SEO, stand the chance to receive at least in the current system, if you looked at that spreadsheet close enough, at least 66% of the tokens that they state back in the form either of donations or complaints, right? You can think of like an upvote essentially as a donation to the product which implements all kinds of interesting decentralized patronage systems as a side effect of this optimal curation of information. And when you want to complain, that money also goes back to the developers. So they stand to earn a huge portion of what they stake to rank back if the community interacts with and cares about their product, which is enormously cool. And like I say, the more total SNT is staked in the store to rank information as a whole, the less SNT there is in circulation, which means the higher the demand for each individual SNT, and so the greater the benefits to the community of SNT holders, which is what fundamentally this stuff is all about. Like, how do we benefit in the most optimal way, as wide a community as we can, with the different kinds of value that we can now create with these digital networks? So I encourage you very much to think broadly about what it is that you're actually doing in these systems, why it is that they are valuable, uh, and you know what sort of future we can we can implement with uh, some really creative storytelling, which is essentially what this stuff is all about. So uh, yeah, if you want to chat to me, uh, you can go and download our beta, which is on mainnet uh, at status.im. If you uh, have a product that you think would be great to access through a mobile optimized platform that allows people to uh, connect directly to Ethereum, you can apply to status.im/incubate. And if you are a developer and interested in uh, writing code on the cutting edge, then uh, we have a great product called Open Bounties, which will uh, allow you to earn cryptocurrency very easily for any uh, issue or feature that you fix in our repos and some 